Welcome back, everyone, for the closing session. You know, there's a, uh, there's a special place in heaven for those of you who stay around for the, uh, for the, for the last part of the meeting. And, and uh, part of it is going to be the, the uh, scientific satisfaction of hearing the last two presentations. But I'm sure there are additional rewards beyond that. Uh, there are rewards that may be beyond the vision that all of us bring to this. Uh, we, we've heard a whole bunch of interesting um, thoughts about uh, opportunities for interdisciplinary science, about challenges to interdisciplinary science, and about enablers for interdisciplinary science. And I think it's really appropriate that we're going to close this meeting with a, with a conversation about what I think has been one of the key areas where enablers have come from, the private foundation world. Um, Foundations operate under fundamentally different constraints than the federal government. Uh, they operate on a different time scale, and they operate with a different vision of where the community should be headed. And I think that um, there's a real opportunity here to try and uh, figure out in this last session how the different pieces of the puzzle fit together, the, the puzzle that's got uh, the investigators, the journals, and the different kind of funders. And we're, we're fortunate for this afternoon's discussion to have um, two people who have really uh, been extremely important in advancing the agenda of interdisciplinary science in the private foundations. Uh, Maria Pellegrini from the Keck Foundation has uh, worked in a variety of areas after a distinguished career at uh, the University of Southern California. Uh, Bill Robertson, who's a real hero of the ecological community and pushing for interdisciplinary work, has been with the um, uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for, for many years. We'll start out with brief comments from, um, from these two people. We'll follow up with a conversation about uh, really putting the pieces together, and Maria will go first. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's great to, to be here. I've really enjoyed the last uh, day and a half. Um, what I'd like to do uh, to start out is just to tell you all kind of what the ethos, if you will, of the Keck Foundation is and what it, it hopes to accomplish. First, let me say that it, the um, direction of Keck is definitely in terms of basic science. That's what they want to fund, not applied or translational and certainly not clinical science. They, they focus on basic and they focus on basic science in many different uh, areas. We have biomedical sciences that, that Keck funds, but also the physical sciences. And the kinds of projects we see really are all over the map. There's stuff in astrophysics, in nanoscience, um, in virology, and climate science as well. As you can imagine, um, trying to distinguish what the Keck Foundation as a private foundation, a funder of science, can do our money is just very tiny compared to the federal sources. So the, the, the constant challenge is to try to find areas in which the federal sources can't or won't fund for whatever reason and to try to foster then um, special kinds of science that, and, and give them wings in an atmosphere where there uh, just isn't any other chance for this kind of science to get off the ground. So that's what the Keck Foundation looks for. And we don't want things to be the next logical step, but really something new. We also are looking for things that have high impact. Pretty much uh, as I think we heard from our um, distinguished panel of um, journal editors, that they're looking for high impact. And that's what Keck is too. But when you survey the landscape of projects that might have high impact or have the potential for that, you often find that they're also very risky. And luckily, with uh, a private foundation, risk is OK. And I'm happy to say that my board of directors embraces risky projects. Now, you want them to be risky in the right way. You don't want them to be risky because the PI isn't really qualified to carry out the research, but rather risky in the sense that uh, we just don't know how things will turn out, but we're willing to take a chance and see what happens. We're willing to do things at an early stage. We're also willing to have a very long time horizon for results. And that's another very special characteristic that private foundations, uh, science funders, can have. Um, what else happens? Well, we look to, in the case of Keck, we look to universities and, and uh, research institutions to select one or two projects to send to Keck. We have a very small staff. 
uh, in the program areas, and so we need universities to help us out this way. And that's a risky step, too. We don't always know that universities send us exactly the sorts of things we want, but I'll come back to that in a moment. And then ultimately, these projects, which are vetted by staff, then go to our board of directors for lively discussion, I can promise you. It's a fairly large board. It has both Keck family members on it and also more non-family members on the board, many of whom, though not all of whom, have some scientific or engineering training. So we get some pretty lively discussions and ultimately, is this astrophysics project really more exciting and potentially more impactful than this virology project? That's, those are hard decisions to make, but it makes the, the discussion and the interactions uh, certainly, as I said, lively and, and, uh, and fun most of the time. Um, so what has Keck funded? Well, um, I'm looking at Sue Trumore because she was very persuasive at, uh, several years ago at convincing uh, the Keck Foundation that uh, an accelerator mass spectrometer to be put at the University of California at Irvine would really uh, greatly advance this, the study of uh, carbon sinks, especially on land, and I hope to s uh, that that in fact has has come true from all the publications that we see that have come out of there. And and I found out from Sue just now, uh, or yesterday, I guess, that she's still using that mass spec. <laughs> Comes back to use it. Um, <clears throat> there was also the Carnegie Airborne Observatory that the Keck Foundation funded, and. Uh, the PIs there have told us that the sensors and the networks that they, they uh, came up with with the Keck Foundation money served as the basis for the NEON project. So we like to think also that our su most successful projects at Keck have high impact in part because they influence what the federal funders and others will do in the future. So that again is a goal. About a year and a half ago, the Keck Foundation decided for the very first time to try to evaluate some of our grants. And we, we had some very distinguished folks help us out. In fact, in the science and engineering program, Ralph Cicerone was the one who chaired um, the main committee. But that committee appointed uh, four other subcommittees to really look in depth at some of our grants. And I want to share with you just briefly what some of the things that they found, uh, found out were and how we're uh, taking these uh, recommendations to heart. First, they said, keep doing high-impact, high-risk grants. It's OK if you have, in their words were, noble failures. And they pointed out to us that, in some cases, the risky science was, uh, or the risky project uh, came out that Mother Nature doesn't work that way. And so, in fact, what you wanted to do just couldn't be done, because there's a, there's a few um, laws of physics and, and nature that simply didn't go along. That's OK. Keep, that proves that you're doing risky, or you're funding risky science by having some of these noble failures. But they also pointed out to us that lots of times in the failed projects, there are what they called collateral benefits, which I love that phrase. So not collateral damage, but collateral benefits. And that, for example, we funded uh, way back when a project to look for the gene for schizophrenia. Well, we never found it. Um, but when you looked back and saw the number of really now famous geneticists that were trained in the labs that, that we funded at the time, that was a great collateral benefit. So we want to keep doing those, those sorts of things. Um, in addition, they told us that we were um, very productive and helpful to fields if we funded resources. For example, at the Missouri Botanical Garden, we funded the digitization of their 18th and 19th century botanic literature, which is now online, and the entire world can, can use that as a resource. So we want to keep doing that as well. Um, they told us that we should not only fund senior investigators, but also junior investigators, and we're trying hard to, to make that balance. They told us that we should continue to fund people who changed fields, who were senior, more senior investigators, but were bringing new ideas, um, new prospects, new aspects, and maybe new technologies to a field that hadn't seen those before. And that, I think, certainly can apply to climate science. Um, they also told us that we, we needed to work better with the institutions that we funded so they would send us the right sorts of projects. So we've been 
going out on the road and trying to talk with uh, senior administrators in universities and, and research institutions to try to get the very best projects to come in the door. Lastly, let me just say that I, I think one of our very best grants that we made was, in fact, to the National Academies. And it was to fund the National Academies Keck Futures Initiative, or as we call it, NACFI. Not the greatest uh, acronym, but it's the one we know and love. And at NACFI, they produce yearly a symposium which is, by, by definition, interdisciplinary. A couple of years ago, they did one called Complex Systems, which included a lot of climate science and was really very successful. The way that these symposia work is that, again, the National Academies choose the topics and the people who will attend. And it's by invitation only. And it's, again, very, very interdisciplinary. And the nature, I don't know if any of you have been to a NACFI symposium, but it is all based around specific um, problems. It's very problem-based. Again, something that Keck is, is, is um, very happy to do in our regular grant programs as well. And so after one plenary lecture, the group breaks up into separate smaller groups, and each one has a task to try to solve. And the people in the room uh, rarely speak the same languages. They are completely different in terms of their disciplines and backgrounds. And at the end of two sort of days of struggle, it's really quite amazing to see what the reports are at the end of these symposia. So if you s ever see a topic that you like, please, please do apply to come to a NACFI symposium because they're, they're really very exciting and, and also a lot of fun. Um, the other part is that the National Academies also give seed grants. So anyone who has come up with an idea or a collaborator from the NACFI symposia uh, can apply for a seed grant to get some of this um, really good collaborative and interdisciplinary science off the ground. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about the background of Keck, and I will leave it at that until uh, the questions time. So thank you.